Good morning, Travis Baptist Church. How are y'all doing today? Very good to see you all here again on our second Sunday back together. Let's go ahead and start off with Majesty, hymn number 74. Stand up. Majesty. The scripture reading today is from Romans 5, 5 through 8. Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. Let's pray together. Our Lord and our God, it is so good to know this. That you didn't wait for us to get better. You didn't wait for us to become perfect. You didn't ask us to become something we were incapable of being. But while we were yet sinners, you gave us your only Son. That in his death and his resurrection, we can become your children. So God, we praise you and thank you for this. And we pray this morning for all who are struggling right now, going through this virus, going through the various issues of unemployment and and underemployment that have come our way, those who are struggling in so many ways and emotionally, and, and God, we just need a touch from you. We need you to speak life to us today through your word, through your spirit, that each one here, whether they're here in the in the building or watching us at home, Lord, that all of them will come to know you in a better way. So work through this, Lord. Bless them. Let us all know how much you love us. We say these things in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, and you can be seated. Um, we are glad you're here today for our second service back after the quarantine. So um, we're going to continue like this for probably at least through the end of May, and we will see where we go from there. So uh, thank you for being so supportive, so patient, and for participating like you have. Again, we will be posting the service uh, late this afternoon. Last week, I don't know what it was, the, the technology didn't want to cooperate, so it took right up till almost 6 o'clock to get everything done. So hopefully it will be a lot better than that today. We will again try to have the DVDs ready between 5 and 6 um, if you want to pick some up uh, to share with your friends. And, uh, uh, but we should be ready to go by then, okay? And then it will be also on the YouTube and Facebook um, at those times. So hopefully all that will come together good, all right? Um, and again, we want to encourage you, you know, if you're having any kind of health issues, any kind of fever and all that, be sure and stay home. We're doing everything we can to get the, the service out to where you can access it. So uh, please be patient with that. 
this coming um, Saturday uh, is going to be the memorial service for Peter Abrignani. And uh, that will be at 11 o'clock here in the sanctuary. We're going to kind of try and do the best we can. I have no idea how many people are coming. Um, we will have as many masks available as we got. Um, we encourage you to bring one. And uh, some of the deacons, we're going to get here early, wipe things down good again. And then we'll do it again for Sunday morning of next week. But it'll be at 11 o'clock um, this coming Saturday in this room. And it will also be posted a few hours after the service, as soon as we can get everything taken care of again. Um, he has family members across San Antonio, New York, New Jersey, and uh, that are going to want to watch. So we'll be posting it, uh, the service, in the afternoon. So if you're not comfortable coming um, to the memorial service, it will once again uh, be up on the websites, okay? Please keep that in mind. And again, last week we uh, uh, showed the video, and we'll show it again in a couple more weeks. But First Blessings, the ministry we introduced to you last week. This summer, um, we will be having on August 8th uh, a chance to minister to community, to, to give out shoes to children, and uh, we'll be regist beginning registration soon. Cindy Villarreal is in charge of this, so... Let her know if you want to help because we're going to be hitting you up pretty soon with sign-up sheets and phone calls and other stuff like that, all right? Um, we do have to provide. We were hoping to have uh, a total of 100 kids. That was kind of our goal. We are required to pay uh, $20 per shoe to the ministry per pair of shoes for this, all right? And before you get scared of that, Cindy and I had a, had a phone conversation with the guy who's the director of this ministry. And he done found someone to spot us the first 1,500. So God's working already. So uh, please, um, what we're going to do, the, the, the shoe distribution is going to be August the 8th. Training day is going to be August the 1st. That's a Sunday afternoon. And uh, so that uh, you'll know what you're doing when you come back on that Saturday. The big thing is right now, be praying about how you want to help. Everything from helping people park to get into the building, washing feet so the kids can put on a new pair of socks. Um, Things like that, uh, sitting down and just talking to people, serving them a meal, um, all of those things. There's a place for everybody here. Whatever it is you like to do, except stay home, um, we have a job for that, all right? If you're the type that stays home, we're going to give you a whole bunch of phone numbers. You've got to call them, okay? You're not going to be doing nothing, all right? You have told me for quite a while, we need to get younger families in here. We got a chance here, folks, so be part of it, okay? Um, and, and set that uh, first weekend, uh, the 1st and the 8th of August, um, one day for training, one day for, for the shoe distribution, okay? So please keep that as a matter of prayer. Yes, the rest of our summer activities, as far as we're concerned, we're moving forward. Vacation Bible School is still July 6th through the 10th. Um, it's probably time to start working on decorations and, and all of that, so we will be letting you know more information there. Uh, we also... Uh, have a trip to camp at Alto Frio planned for the teenagers. The I believe it's the 13th through the 18th or the 17th, whatever Friday is that week uh, of July. And uh, so please, if you've got a teenager who wants to go, let us know about that, and we're going to start getting that information out this week also. Okay? Um, it is that time of year. We're having all the graduations and stuff. And normally we have a Sunday where we honor our high school graduates. And uh, frankly, we just didn't have any this year. Oh, well. Um, however, we've got a couple of graduates. One, um, he graduated at home and he's there this morning. Uh, William Wright, uh, Pam and William Wright, Pam's husband, William. He graduated this last week with his business bachelor, business administration, bachelor's in business administration. There we go. All right, and uh, over at A&M Kingsville, William is a uh, veteran of the United States Army. He has been working ever since we've known him over at the Home Depot on Port Avenue in the uh, tool rental department. He's the guy to go see for that. Uh, him and Pam have been faithful members here, and uh, uh, it's good to see him at this point in his life, still moving forward and uh, uh, getting his degree. So we congratulate him. Let's give him a hand today. All right. And our other one is Kirk Stowers. Come on up, Kirk. Okay. Because when we do it with the high school kids, we always try and read a speech and get their mom to cry and that kind of stuff. Um, but anyway, 
Kirk is a 2020 graduate from Stark College and Seminary here in Corpus Christi with a Master's of Arts in Ministry. For those of you that uh, that sounds new to you, um, the Stark College and Seminary is the old South Texas School of Christian Studies. And so they, they changed their name. As you are well aware, he's been a police officer with the city of Corpus Christi since 2006. And he will begin the testing process for uh, supervisory positions uh, in, in July this year. The degrees are helping him in that, we sure hope. And so uh, pray that God will open up the door there. Um, the greatest lesson, Kirk says, that he learned at Stark is that the Bible is not just a book of information, but it's a book of transformation. Kirk has become a better person today than he was yesterday because he's learned to read the Bible effectively and able to see the Bible as a mirror rather than a collection of stories or of mysterious places. He sees himself and our society and all its failures that are written in the Bible. As a law enforcement officer, you're certainly going to see the, the worst side of all of us on a daily basis. And, uh, but he also realizes that in this ministry of being a law enforcement officer, um, that he's there uh, to share the glory of God, to let people know that God not only loves us, but wants us to love each other. And police work is one of the best mission fields for him because he goes to the homes of strangers who are in a crisis, who need to experience, well, they are experiencing the worst day of their lives and able to share with them the experience of God's love that they need to hear and feel so much. This is done through the grace, mercy, respect, and love that Christ puts in all our hearts. Um, his purpose statement is to share the gospel with others and develop healthy relationships with those around him in an effort to glorify God. A uh, favorite life verse in the Bible is to do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Leviticus 19.18. And so I hope you will join me as uh, he takes this step in life and as William also has... Uh, taking this step forward and praying for the both of them. Let's pray for them. Our Father in heaven, the achievements we make pale in comparison to the work that you're doing inside of us. But we are grateful that you put within us the desire to meet goals, to reach standards, to improve and to grow and to be more useful to you. So we thank you for Kirk. We thank you for William. We're praying for doors of opportunity to continue to be opened up for them to represent you we're praying that these times and the sacrifices they've made will be honored by you and that you will bless them greatly. We pray for their families who have supported them, their wives, for, for Cindy and Pam, God, and the, the, the sacrifices they've made during this time. We pray that you will let your grace be extended to them also. In all these things, Lord, we're praying for that day when you return for us. But until then, Lord, we want to be useful for you. We want to be serving you. And we pray for both of these gentlemen that you, God, would shine through them. And we say these things in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Congratulations. Yes, sir. Amen. All right. Again, we have this flap on our bulletin cover. If you're visiting with us for the first time or the first time in a while, we invite you to fill it out, tear it off, and drop it in the offering plates. If you'll remember, we now have the offering plates uh, we got two on each side, and we got uh, two, four in the back, okay? And just as you see fit to go by and drop in your offering and your guest card, all right? Communication card. This is also good. If you're visiting with us, if you'll get us some information. We'll get information to you about our church. If you just need to update uh, your emails, telephone numbers, addresses, anything like that, or even just put a prayer request on there, uh, this is the form to use, Okay. We would appreciate that. And uh, now if you will stand. If I let you greet one another, can you promise not to touch one another? You want to do that? Okay. We'll give you a couple minutes here and then I'll call you back and you got to get back in your place. All right. Go say hello to each other. Okay. <laughs> yeah. They've been so good, I thought I'd give them a little bit of freedom.
If you will make your way back to your place now, we didn't want to put you at too much risk, but uh, if you'll start making your way back to your place, and we will continue in our worship service, all right? Let's make our way back now. Mm -hmm. Continuing on to our praise and worship section, Seek Ye First, hymn number 42. to have our oops, family prayer time. I'll get my mask ready. Um, do want you to remember pray for Scott Jones and his family. They went up to Baylor this weekend to move their son from Baylor up to Greenville, right? Greenville, Texas. He got a job right out of school. So um, that's where they're at this weekend. And so we want to pray for the Joneses as they're traveling. We want to pray for the Abrignanis as they face um, coming up with the memorial service for their son. And um, we have several that have been in and out of the hospital. We have people having biopsies done. Carolyn Rains was having, over at MD Anderson, having a skin cancer check, so please remember her. Um, Monica Humphrey begins treatment uh, on Tuesday, so you want to keep praying for her. And uh, I know Barbara and Sam, Barbara's uh, niece, Brandy Leonard, who's had so many bouts with cancer, is having a new round of treatments coming up. So uh, keep them in your prayers. If you would like to come to the altar and be prayed with or just come to the altar, it's open and uh, we'll be here to pray with you, all right? 
So uh, let's bow our heads. It's time for our prayer time. Feel free if you wish to come forward. Our Father and our God, keep us near the cross. Keep us near your throne. So many things that disappoint and distract us right now. So many things that are frustrating us, causing us to lose hope. So many are battling depression. So many are battling financial issues. Lord, these things weigh on our hearts. Some of us, Lord, are losing hope. God, we're asking, send your spirit. Reach down and touch those who are hurting, those who are struggling. Let them see that you're working and that something great is going to happen soon. Help us to see, Lord, as we struggle along our way, that every step of the way, you, Jesus, are with us. That our eyes would be open as we see your hands at work. That our minds and our ears would be open as we hear your voice. God, guide us, bless us, and empower us. We're praying for those that are struggling with cancer right now, with tests and biopsies and treatments. We're praying for those, Lord, who are overcoming surgeries, those who are overcoming other physical problems. We pray for those who are struggling right now because their immune systems are are compromised, and we're praying, God, that you will give them hope, that you will keep them safe and strong. We're praying for those, Lord, who have reached the end of their rope with with the conditions we're having to live under, and Lord, that you would give them patience and help them to see, Lord, that you are opening up new doors. Praying for those with financial issues, Lord, that you will provide work for them, that you'll provide opportunity for them. Praying for those at every level of leadership, from the parents of a household to the President of the United States, That at every level, Lord, leaders make wise decisions. We struggle, Lord, with what's best for ourselves, for our families, for our church, our city, our county, our state, our nation, even the whole world. But God, it's all in your hands. So we ask you, let us be at peace. When we disagree with the decision, Lord, let us just simply agree that you're going to see us through. That we do not need to speak ill of others. We do not need to get overly angry. We simply need to represent you. And God, we ask you, use this time to shine through your people. When our rights are violated, we ask you, Lord, to shine through us with your mercy and grace. When we fear what may be happening and what may be happening to our family members, we pray that you will shine through with your mercy and your grace. Wherever we land in all these feelings around here, Lord, You be glorified. Glorify yourself through us. God, let us be your people. Shine through us, Lord. And we pray as we go through these times that just as we just sang a moment ago, you are Lord. You have risen from the dead and you are Lord. And that means you're good for today for getting us through it. 
You are good for forgiving us of all our sins, for giving us an eternal life, and all these things, but you're also good for the struggle we're going through right now. Be our Lord, Jesus. Be on your throne. And let us see the directions where to go. As we make decisions, Lord, as we take steps, give us peace with that. We know you're there at the end. This thing is not too big for you. And our lives are not too messed up for you. And our fears are not too strong. And our frustrations are not too ugly. Work through them all, Lord. Reach down, God. Give us that grace. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. So, Lord, teach us to be patient and loving with one another. We pray not only for our two men that have graduated universities, but also, Lord, for all the people graduating high schools and colleges right now. So many that are wondering what the future holds for them when they can't see past next week. Well, God, give them comfort. Help the doors open up for them so they can all stand back and see what a mighty God we've got. What a wonderful Savior it is that will see us through the darkest of times. We pray for those that will be traveling. We pray for all those, Lord. And we say it all in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Continuing on with our devotional worship, the old rugged cross, hymn 186, verses 1, 2, and 4.
because of that old rugged cross, he lives. Hymn number 220. We love you, Lord. We praise your name. You are alive. And for this, Lord, we know we have resurrection. We have eternity. We have forgiveness. All because you live. Open our eyes up to your word today, Lord. Speak to us. Teach us. Draw us close. We say these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. We're glad you're here with us today as we continue our series in 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 3 is where we're at, and we're going to do verses 18 through 22. 1 Peter chapter 3. And uh, uh, while we're turning there, we're going to talk a little bit today about the victory of suffering. I left my thing over here. And uh, because sometimes we always think that the ones that are suffering, they're the ones who got beat. They're the ones who lost. They're the ones who got left behind. But the Bible seldom, if ever, teaches that suffering means you lost. So often, suffering means you gain. In fact, the Apostle Paul in the book of Philippians says, For me, life is Christ, and even death is gain. So, when you think about the, the bad things that come your way and how much of a struggle they are, remember, quite often suffering is a blessing from God, something that He will use in a powerful way. So we're going to talk today about the victory of suffering, our series on 1 Peter about wolves among sheep, how we as God's people outnumbered, outmanned, 
and yet we will have that victory because of our shepherd, Jesus Christ. We're going to read 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 through 22. Would you stand, please, for the reading of God's Word? 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that He might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, by whom He also went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient, when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. There is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. Thank you, God, for the blessing of your word. Teach us. We say this in the name of Christ. Amen. You can be seated. And um, as we said, today's message, the victory of suffering, because quite often we think suffering is not victory. And yet for God and from his viewpoint and what he accomplishes, through the struggles and the trials and the suffering and the pain, it is so amazing how much more He is able to do through us. As you think about this, and um, we will probably be mentioning this on Saturday, but sometimes people like to say things like, you know, that person suffered so much in their life, they're going to heaven because of what they suffered. But, but that's not true at all. The Bible doesn't tell us that we get to go to heaven because of what we've suffered we get to go to heaven because of what Christ suffered. And as we think about this, we remember this. When we speak of the victory of suffering, it is there because of what Jesus Christ went through. When he died upon that old rugged cross, when he rose from that grave on the third day, because he lives, we have all this victory, all this blessing, all this that is available to us simply by believing in him. So let's take a look at what's going on here there in 1 Peter chapter 3. And as we read, you probably noticed a little bit of um, some things that get a little bit debatable among people sometimes. We're going to deal with that. And, uh, but I think we'll see a very interesting passage for us in, in what suffering can mean for us. So we start off with this, that everything happened in our life, that victory is coming for you, victory is coming for me, the quarantine is going to be lifted, the, the times are going to be good again, and all because that victory is coming because Jesus Christ suffered. One day he's returning to set up his kingdom. One day he's returning and sin is going to be eliminated. One day he's returning and all evil will be put away. And it's all coming because he suffered. Look at verse 18. For Christ also suffered. Although he was God the Son, God from eternity past, he came down, born of the virgin, and he went to that cross. He did not escape any ounce of suffering that a human being could go through. Whether he's suffering caused by rejection from friends and those who ought to love you, whether it's uh, suffering caused by the injustice of life, like an illegal trial and being arrested when you've done nothing wrong, whether it's the suffering of physical torment, of having the whip coming down on your back, the suffering of humiliation as they spit upon you and slapped you. The humiliation of being all, all that rejection going on and then the physical pain of being nailed to that cross. And then there's the spiritual suffering he went through where as the world grew dark, he saw his father turning his back upon him, crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Christ suffered every way imaginable. So whatever suffering you've gone through, whatever suffering that's come your way, understand this. Jesus is not carrying down a road that he hasn't himself walked on. Christ suffered. Now let's make this clear though. When Christ suffered, he suffered once. The suffering for our sin, the punishment we deserved that he suffered, happened one time and one time only. The good news is for me and you, the punishment of my sin, the wrath of God, it came down on Jesus instead of me one time and one time only. So I don't have to beat myself up with it myself. 
I don't have to continue running myself down. I don't have to continue looking at myself and saying, what is wrong with me? Jesus Christ died. He suffered once for each and every one of us. Because it goes on to say he suffered once. He suffered for the guilty. He himself was innocent. Verse 18 says, Christ suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, the righteous for the unrighteous. Whatever translation you got there, the idea is this. You were guilty. He wasn't. You deserved the punishment. He didn't. You deserved the condemnation. He suffered it. He experienced it, and you and I don't have to. The beauty of his suffering is that because he did it that one time, and it was for all of us who are guilty. So for those who wonder, could he actually have done it for me? The answer is yes. For those who wonder, what have I got to do to qualify? I've already been asked this question. We're doing the first blessing, the shoe ministry, this summer, August the 8th. And I've been asked, what do kids have to do to qualify for this? And the answer is, they've got to fill out the form. Their parents got to fill out the form. That's it. Whether they make 100000 or they make nothing, they can get a pair of shoes. In the same way, you and I may wonder, how do I qualify for this great salvation? What have I got to do for it? Well, Donna Curl will give you a form at the end of the service, right? You fill that thing out. Well, really, no, it's not even that. It's you just saying, Jesus, I need this. See, we're giving shoes to any kid who says he needs the shoes. Jesus is giving salvation to anyone who says, I need this salvation. He's giving it to anyone who knows that they can't get this on their own. He's giving it to anyone. And no matter how guilty we are, no matter how much we've failed, no matter what devastation and damage we've caused, He suffered the sinless one for the sinful ones, the righteous for the unrighteous, the just for the unjust. He suffered, as it says, once for sins. All our sins. The whole world of all time. This has been done for you and me. And so, as we consider this, um, we need to realize that what he has done and his suffering that he did one time for the sinners, he did it to bring us to God. Because that sin kept us away. That sin made us think that God wouldn't hear our prayers. That sin made us think that God's got nothing to say to us and that we have no right to come before him. And yet when Christ died on that cross, the message was this, you can come. How did he put out that message? Where was he crucified? On top of Mount Calvary. Who was crucified with him? A thief and a murderer on each side. Two guys who are incredibly guilty. They deserved the death he was suffering. But one of them cried out to him and said, Lord, remember me. And to that one, Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. See, there he was, the worst sinner, the guy with no chance to make up for it, no way, no opportunity to come back and, and do enough to make for, up for his bad deeds. He didn't even get a chance to say he was sorry to the people he, was hurt, he had hurt. But because he cried out to Christ in that moment, Jesus brought him to God. Today, you'll be with me in paradise. To you, Right now, where you're sitting, whether it's at home or here in the church, whatever's going on in your life, He will bring you to God. This is what He came to do. We've been separated, alienated. We've been strangers. We can't come near God on our own. But when Christ died, He tore down all the barrier that was between us. And now you who come to Him and say, Lord, forgive me, and I come just trusting that what Jesus did, what happens is my sin washed by his blood his death covering my punishment so each of us can now come to God as we see fit he has opened up the door for you and I we couldn't get close to God without him but he suffered so that we could in his suffering he brings us close we've mentioned suffering several times here in first Peter and that we have to go through it as Christians, and he's giving us the great example of it right here, is what Jesus did for us. And why to be a follower of Christ means it's going to come our way once in a while too. So he suffered to bring us to God, to get us close. And he suffered 
when he suffered, and this is what's so good for you and me, when he suffered, it did not destroy him. Look at the end of verse 18. Christ suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. Human beings nailed him. They let him die, but they didn't kill him. He gave his life up willingly. But he was put to death in the flesh, but then what happens? They lay him in that tomb. They roll the stone across it. They, they station the guards outside of it. They put a seal upon it, and yet when Sunday came around, that stone was rolled away. That seal was broken. The guards had scattered in fear, and Jesus was alive. Jesus had risen from the dead. We are confident we have victory because Jesus not only died to pay that punishment, it wouldn't have meant anything if he stayed in that grave. But because he came out, now you and I can say hallelujah. He lives, he lives. Christ Jesus lives today. And because he lives, he walks with me, he talks with me along life's narrow way. You ask me how I know he lives? He lives within my heart. The difference he's made in my life. The fact that I know you can tell me you have no evidence at all. I can't see Jesus, but I'll tell you what. Something I didn't used to believe one night, I started believing. He came in, and I have not been the same since. You ask me how I know he lives, he lives within my heart. Can you say that? Because he suffered, because he once suffered, because he suffered for the sins, the just for the unjust, he did that to bring us to God, but that death did not hold him. He resurrected to let us know, yes, that suffering was good. And just like he died and rose again, you and I have chance at a new life. Now, we do a thing to show that to everybody, don't we? When you're a new believer at Travis Baptist Church, we encourage you to be baptized. We take you back up there with that big, behind that big cross and in front of that stained glass window, and we dunk you under the water. We call that baptism. We don't do it to take your sins away. We do it to tell everybody that just like Jesus suffered and died, you've died also to your old life. And when we bring you up out of the water in the same way that Christ resurrected, you've got a new life now also. Verse 19. Jesus was made alive by the Spirit. Now we got this crazy little set of three verses here. It says in verse 19, by whom he also went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. There is also now an antitype which now saves us, baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. See, victory is coming because Christ suffered, but victory is also coming because this victory is pictured in Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6 is where we begin the story of one of the Bible's most famous characters, Noah. If you'll remember that story, um, back in Noah's day, um, evil had spread, and God goes, why did I ever make mankind? When it's all said and done, as we're, we're going to review it all here in a moment, in verse 19, it says, By whom he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient when the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah. These guys in verse 19, these spirits in prison, they are traced back to the days of Noah. That's what verse 20 is doing for us. Nowhere in the Bible speaks about this thing in detail, so we shouldn't form a whole lot of convictions about it, but there's a victory here. Now let's remember about the days of Noah. What was going on in the days of Noah? One of the main things we remember about the days of Noah is the domination of evil. That meant evil was running rampant. We all, you know, in Sunday school, God was mad at everybody, so Noah's family got to be on the ark. God made it rain, and the ark floated, and Noah was safe. But you've got to remember how bad things were back then. Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 and 6. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now you may say this is like, what, five, 6,000 years ago that this happened. 
well, people haven't changed much, have they? Um, we're still like this. So God looks upon the earth. He sees, man, you know, I created Adam and Eve. I created the Garden of Eden and all that. They disobeyed me. A few generations later, by Noah's time, it's just going nuts here. And the Lord was sorry that he made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. What the Bible is communicating to us here, as God looked out on how sinful mankind had begun, become, that it just grieved him and said, you know, and now God doesn't make mistakes. But to put it in language, you and I can understand. The Bible's kind of telling us that, you know, God's sitting there going, did I make a mistake creating people? Should I have done this? Now, we know his will is perfect. His decisions are always right. But as he looks at the earth, the grief and the <coughs> wrath he feels is the kind that makes you think, man, for you and I to relate is the feeling, I wish I'd never done this. So God is upset. God is angered. And there was a time, um, a a as they looked out in that day and age also, if you'll read earlier in the part in, in chapter 6, it speaks of mighty men of renown and the sons of men marrying the, the sons of gods and some kind of crazy race coming out of this. Giants, men of renown, powerful, evil people running rampant in the earth. When the rain came, this evil that was running rampant was to be dominated. Whatever they mean in Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 3 about the daughters of men marrying the sons of God, whether uh, that means some kind of crazy spiritual demonic thing, or is it just that bad people marrying good girls, or whatever it means, when it all comes down to is this is how bad it was and greatly contributed. These people that were the result of these relationships we see in the first verses of Genesis 6, very powerful, very evil, and God says, I just wish I hadn't started this thing. They are dominating society. They are terrorizing it. Now, we read on and we say, these spirits that were in prison formerly were disobedient when the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah. So God is putting up with it and putting up with it, and the time comes that it's time. While the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water. So we've got this evil running rampant, and God says there is salvation for only eight people, Noah and his family. What's happening here? Society is overrun by sin and evil. There's a small minority who believe in God, eight people basically. Um, and uh, uh, in all of this, they are the only ones God saves. You and I as Christians, sometimes we feel we're outnumbered. Now the world's population at that time versus eight people is kind of the ratio we have here in the day of Noah. Evil was so rampant that those eight, Noah, his wife, their three sons, and their wives, were all that God would save. Like Noah, we are a small persecuted minority. We are small lights living in an increasingly dark world and a disobedient world heavily influenced by Satan and his minions and, 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 and his horde. And as Jesus comes to proclaim to Noah and his family, y'all go build that ark and I will save you from all this. That rain begins to come. They get in the ark. And it tells us in Genesis that God closed the door of the ark. Noah might not have had a system of ropes or whatever. God closed that door to let him know that this was his judgment and his salvation. The water rose and many died. That evil that had become so rampant, well, God drowned all of it. And in some form or another, those are the spirits of verse 19 that are in prison. It was Jesus who saved Noah and his family. It was Jesus, and God the Son, in rescuing them during this time. And when Jesus died upon that cross and when it was time for him to proclaim his victory, he went down to those prisons, those evil spirits from the days of Noah, and says, you know, just like I locked you all up in here, I've got some more I'm fixing to throw in here. To let them know that he indeed had won this great victory. You are trapped forever, condemned forever. Why? Because of what the victory that Jesus Christ won. So this thing about the spirits is about the victory of the Lord over evil. 
and that though we thought they were so awesome and powerful, God threw them in jail and threw away the key. And there was Jesus upon his victory day to tell them whether he did back then or also at his time when he uh, uh, defeated Satan upon the cross, but to let those spirits know you have no power here. Jesus Christ, resurrected, has triumphed. And though you outnumbered the minions of hell running the world, God got his eight and destroyed the rest. Now, the story continues though, that in this triumphant gospel proclamation, see, Noah and his family were not saved because they were better than everyone else, but they were saved by merely the grace of God. And those evil ones who thought they were so powerful found out when the rain started, they had no power against the flood. And God won that victory. Salvation may be for only eight, but now this victory is now pictured in baptism also. You've got that picture of the ark floating on the waters we've all heard since kids. And so he goes on and he says, they were saved through water. At the end of verse 20, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water. Wow. They were saved because of that flood and because of that ark. There is now also, in, in, in the New King James says an antitype. Some of the modern translations say that. Um, basically, that word means a picture, an illustration. That the ark is an illustration which now, of what now saves us. And he says, baptism. Woo, that thing we do up there. Now, we are Baptists. Now, the reason we are Baptists is because we baptize by immersion. But another thing about Baptists is what? Do we believe baptism saves you? No, we don't. We believe your profession of faith in Christ saves you, not the dunking in the water. One of the reasons we believe that is because of this verse right here. There is an antitype which saves us, baptism. They were saved through water. Doesn't that tell us that you need to be baptized to be saved? What is he saying, though? Look at it. Baptism. And then it stops. And there's a parenthesis that says, Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God. Baptism, he says, is not the removal of filth from the flesh. Baptism does not wash our sin away. Though your church may have done holy water in the past, our church, we just use Corpus Christi water, it's all H2O. It's got about as much cleansing agent as anything else does. It will not clean past the skin. It will not clean the heart. He says baptism is not the cleansing of the flesh. It is not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but what is baptism? It's the answer of a good conscience towards God. What are we saying? That baptism, whoop, well, let's go ahead there. As we look at this, Noah was not saved because he was better than everyone else. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And that's how he got that ark. God gave him the ark and to save his family. Now, so baptism then is about grace. Baptism does not wash away your sins. But when you get baptized up there, it is the answer of a good conscience. Baptism doesn't wash away sin, but it is a public testimony of salvation. What are you saying when you go up there? Pastor David asks you, do you believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins upon the cross? And do you believe that God raised him from the, on the third day? And do you believe that he now lives in your heart as your personal Lord and Savior? And when you say yes to all three, I say, now I baptize you, my brother or my sister, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and you're dead with him, and you're risen with him. Baptism is that good answer of the good conscience, yes, I believe. In the moment you answer the Lord, yes, you believe, that is when you are saved. That is when the filth is washed away. That is when you are cleansed. The baptism is kind of like the ark. You entered into that ark. It wasn't the getting on of the ark. It was trusting God to build it and trusting God that he was going to keep that ark floating. He found grace 
in the eyes of God. He was not perfect. Christ suffered one time, the just for the unjust. Christ suffered to bring us to God, to get us on the ark, if you will. Christ suffered, and death didn't stop him because he rose from that grave. Now, this thing about the baptism, he ties it in there and says it's the same thing. He is saving you from all the evil, his suffering, to save you from all the evil that's caused your suffering. He found grace. Baptism is a picture of that victory. See, evil was winning in the days of Noah, but God won in the end. Evil feels like it's winning right now. Your God is going to win. Victory is assured. How do I know he's going to win in the end? Well, as we finish up in verses 21 and 22, after he says that baptism is the answer of a good conscience towards God. Baptism is a picture of salvation through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. How do we know victory is assured that Jesus suffered? First off, it's by His resurrection. The most important thing we believe as Christians that makes everything else true is that Jesus rose from the grave. This victory... Baptism means nothing because, you know, dunking you down in the water means one thing. But to be the picture of what happened with Jesus, we bring you back up. Just like he died and was buried, we bring you back up. He was raised. Because your old life died and buried with him, raised with him. This resurrection is what's pictured in baptism. This thing about him suffering once for everyone, the culmination of it is, but he didn't stay in that grave. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. Made alive in the Spirit didn't mean he was just a ghost, because when he got around his disciples, they stuck their hands in their wounds. He ate with them. He walked with them. They knew he was real. And everything changed because of that. So this resurrection assures us of the victory. Verse 22 says, And he has gone into the heaven and is at the right hand of God. How do we know his victory is assured? By his ascension, he went up into heaven. They watched him that day of Pentecost. Watched him ascending, or before Pentecost, watching him ascending up into heaven. And the two angels told him, just like you saw the Son of Man go away, he's going to come back from the sky. He ascended to sit at the right hand of the Father, his exaltation. He ascended and is at the right hand of the Father, at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to Him. This one who suffered one time, this one who suffered the just for the unjust, to bring us to God, and the Spirit raised Him from the dead, He won such a victory that while He laid there and took the slaps and the whips, and the thorns, and the nails, and the scorn, and the rejection, and the denials, and all that he put up with. All those, just like those spirits in the days of Noah that were dancing around thinking, we in charge, we got it, we got it. They all woke up one day and found themselves under the feet of Jesus. All those principalities and powers subject to him. And this is why he brought the Noah story in. We think evil is so powerful. We think the devil is so strong. We've seen so many movies about how the Christians barely win at the end. We're thoroughly convinced. And the fact is, no, God comes in when it is time and he stomps and he wins. It's described as the wine press of God. What it, in Revelation, it talks about the, the wrath of the wine press of God. What goes on in a wine press? A whole lot of stomping and crushing. It's not much of a fight when God steps in. When Jesus comes back on that white horse in Revelation 19, he opens his mouth, a sword comes out, and it's over. This victory that you think is so far away is still right there at our fingertips. This world that you think has beaten us down so much and is causing so much suffering, remember, our victory is coming through all that suffering. Jesus Christ suffered In the days of Noah, they suffered. You and I, this weak little minority that we feel like we're overwhelmed and that we are outmanned and outgunned on every side, 
our God wins the victory. One day, we all get on that ark and God closes the door. And as the waters of judgment rise, the rest of the world screams and cries and wakes up experiencing their condemnation, eternally separated from God. And there is Jesus because you did not choose Him, because you did not seek Him, because you did not trust Him, letting you know this door isn't opening back up. There is a judgment for those who don't choose His victory today. Because we think we're, it looks from the outside like we're on the losing side. But the victory comes every time. And it's always when it's darkest. There was Christ upon that cross. There was Christ utterly defeated. There was Christ crying out, It is finished. Into thy hands I commend my spirit. And then he went limp. And the demons may have danced. And they may have been thrilled. And, and they set the guard outside the tomb. And they put the stone up there. But what happened? I don't think it was just the guards that had to run away that Sunday morning. I think the demons had to too. Their party was broken up. Jesus was made alive. Jesus resurrected ascended to the right hand of the Father. And all those powers that we think are so awesome and powerful, they are subject to Him. That's the side you want to be on in this thing. As you're facing the struggles, as you're facing life and its pains and its trials, and it looks like you're overwhelmed, remember this. That Christ who suffered at the beginning of that little passage had His feet propped up on the backs of those enemies. Even the angels, the demons, Satan himself, all subject to him. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is risen from the grave and he is Lord. Today, would you give your heart to him? He has done this to make you his child. As you go through the suffering and struggles you're going through right now, turn your heart to him. Today, we're going to have a time of prayer here in a moment. Maybe you want to pray and ask for the first time in your life, Jesus, to come into your life. Maybe you just want to say, man, I'm going through so much right now, Lord. I just need that touch to be reminded that as you suffer, you got through it. You were raised up. There's an end to our suffering. And that suffering ends at resurrection. Because he's gone to prepare a place for us. You have that hope today. Let's bow our heads. Our Lord and our God, it is so good to know that you saved us. You suffered for us. And you won a great and mighty victory. We may not understand everything, Lord, but we do know this. This was a complete and utter domination. The devil didn't even belong on the same playing field as you. Didn't stand a chance. And yet from our standpoint, it looks so difficult, so harsh, but that was the price of our sins. There may be some here today that have never realized that, but now realize you poured your anger out on those, on Him, on your Son Jesus, instead of on those who deserve it, me and the people in this room. That is your mercy, Lord, the grace that we have found in your eyes. Today, Lord, if anyone will believe and say, yes, I believe this, Jesus, that you suffered for me, and that you rose from the grave on the third day. You tell us as many as receive your Son, you give the power to become the children of God. That in that moment, we go from being orphans to being your children. Lord, it secures our eternity, and so we want that. We're praying that someone today is, is asking you. And for the rest of us as believers, Lord, to realize as dark as life gets... Suffering always comes before the big victory. It took a cross to bring about the resurrection. It took the darkness of Good Friday to give us Easter Sunday. Through the beauty of it all is, Lord, you are risen from the grave and you are Lord. Help us this week as we face the evil out there to realize you are on your throne. And you have the victory at hand.
We trust you with that. In the name of Christ, we say it. Amen. So we're going to have our hymn of invitation. Maybe you're with us for the, and you're feeling maybe you would like to come and be part of Travis Baptist Church. Maybe today is the day you're saying, I want to know more about this salvation. I want to know more about baptism. Come down here and let me pray with you about that. Uh, maybe you want to become part of our church by transfer of letter from another church or, or some other means. Come tell me about it and we'll pray with you, all right? So we're going to sing. What number are we singing? Number 372. Would you stand, please? We invite you to come. Come tell me about any decision you want to make today. As we sing, we invite you to come. the day for you that Christ is calling your heart and you're answering that you finally understood he gave himself for you and you're ready to give your heart back to him is today that day That you're ready to, to honor Him, to follow Him.